Welcome to the Sleepy Gamer Channel, where we talk about religion, politics, and culture. Um, today, I'm going to be watching and giving commentary on an interview that Don Lemon did with Taylor Lorenz and Dr. Jen Goldbeck. Um, you may be familiar with Taylor Lorenz from the interview she did with uh, Libs of TikTok not too long ago. I went over that interview. It was, it was definitely something. Um, but today they are talking about the far right, Gaza, uh, the college protest, and more, looks like. I'm going to be listening at 1.5 speed, see what they have to say, and uh, dissect a little bit of it. So I think you're really going to enjoy the show today because the internet and technology are influencing, even shaping every aspect of our lives from politics to war, to music, to entertainment and culture. And my next two guests today, that's why I think you're going to like this program. They're experts in all of this. So I'm going to talk to Taylor Lorenz, a Washington Post columnist who covers internet culture, and also Dr. Jen Goldbeck, a professor at the University of Maryland, an AI expert and the publisher of the MAGA Report. MAGA Report. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Listen, we could not have done this. The timing It's you know, I hate what's going on in the country, especially as it relates to these protests and the war, of course, in Gaza and Israel. But it's very, it's very timely to have you on. I want to start with, with what's happening on college campuses all across America, this massive wave of unrest, Dr. Goldbeck. You wrote just this morning that uh, in right-wing discussions that you have been monitoring, many are arguing that Gaza protests are an opportunity to split the Democratic electorate. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, you know, on one hand, I think we're seeing this in, in public statements from a lot of communities, especially the Muslim community is saying they're having a hard time feeling like they want to support Biden in the upcoming election, given the policy that's going on with Israel. Um, but interestingly, you know, if we look at the far right, we look back to 2016 and Cambridge Analytica, the Russian influence operations, you know, they were posting a lot in like Black Lives Matter communities. And it's not that they were going to get those people to vote for Trump. They just wanted to get them not to go vote for Clinton and to kind of push on these divisive issues within the left. And now what I see looking at these far right forums that I monitor is that they're going like, hey, the Democrats are mad at each other. And if we can push on this, it may bring down the Democratic vote or get them to go for a third party candidate. And that's the way that we can get Trump reelected. So that's that's the goal then. So you, you don't none of this. I don't know. None of it do, so you think that this is organic or it's being stirred up by a certain group. Taylor, go ahead. I know it looks like you want to jump in. <laughs> it is, of course, organic. And if the Democratic leadership is so wildly out of line with young people and the issues that they care about today, that's not. Yes, of course, Republicans are going to seize on that. But that is not driven. These protests are not driven by Republican trolls. In fact, even just last night at the UCLA encampment, you know, you constantly see these right wing content creators and influencers trying to show up to these protests and co-opt these movements. And they have been wildly unsuccessful in doing those in person, at least. I, I, you know, of course, they're going to do it online. But I don't want I just don't, don't want to give anyone the false impression that these are not organic movements driven by very impassioned. Students. OK, let's go with this because. So I think this something this is hard because something to consider is that during the BLM protest, as Jinklebeck said, um, we found clear evidence that Russia was um, trying to influence things and and divide. They played both sides. They were putting out um, divisive things on the BLM side. They were putting out divisive things on the. Uh, far right side and basically stirring up more conflict and um, radicalizing people. And so I, I think that's something that it, it's important to be wary of and be aware of. I, I like I, to me, I think it is um, very naive to think that that is not also happening in this situation here. But also, not that doesn't like dismiss the situation or dismiss the uh, protests or what's going on. Doesn't mean it's not organic. It doesn't mean that the people who care about this or are doing this um, are doing so just because of propaganda. But I, I think it is good to be mindful of uh, the ways in which we can be radicalized online and, and to be wary of that. And not just dismiss it as an attempt to dismiss the cause in general. And there are going to be some people who want to do that. To say, well, none of this matters. None of this is real because, um, you know, we saw in the past that Russia was involved in or foreign actors in general have been involved in um, kind of pushing radicalization and division uh, on hot button issues like this. And this is a, just like a handed on a silver platter for some foreign country to come and interfere. And last time it seemed very clear that the goal was to 
um, push people away from uh, Biden and more towards Trump. And so, again, I'm never going to like use that as an argument to try to convince someone that, you know, um, that they are wrong or that they need to vote for Biden or anything like that. But it, it's just something to be aware of and, and to be realistic about. Because when I talk to, you know, older folks uh, and many of them Jewish, they'll say the kids don't know what they're doing. They don't know the history um, that they're being co-opted by uh, their professors and going to liberal schools. Uh, and it's just that, you know, they're being indoctrinated. What do you say to that? That's absurd and ridiculous. Uh, the students, especially massive amounts of these students are Jewish. Um, many of the professors are professors of Jewish history, of people that teach oppression. Um, it's specifically because they understand the history and because they have solidarity with marginalized groups that they care about these issues so deeply. So I think that they're just, they have very different views of the political landscape than their elders. I don't doubt that, but it's not because they're indoctrinated by anything. I don't even know who would be that, doing that indoctrination because the media coverage of these protests has been so skewed towards the older point of view. There is a lot of propaganda indoctrination coming from like the very far left on this issue. Some of the professors have been straight up unhinged um, in their rhetoric, rhetoric, just like like blatant Hamas support and and um, celebrating October seventh. Um, yeah. I think that the majority of the protesters and the majority of people in general who are pro-Palestinian just don't have that great of a grasp on the history. Um, but you don't you don't need to have a great grasp on the history to know that what's happening right now is tragic and needs a peaceful solution. And Israel is not interested in that peaceful solution. And they're not going to be effective advocates or uh, partners towards that peaceful solution. Right. That's not the that's not the complicated part. But a lot of people just are not that um, well informed on on the history and on the uh, context of the conflict. It's hard to listen to people say like these people understand the history so well, and that's that's why they're so passionate about it. And it's no no not really. Um, that they just see people being killed and um and that's not that's not a good thing it's not and and it it they're passionate about it um and and there's nothing wrong with that but I, i've it's it's hard to listen to people say that and then watch protesters uh be interviewed and and say they don't really know what intifada means uh, they don't really know the significance of from the river to the sea, that, that kind of phrase and why that might be um, a little unclear or a little uh, off-putting to some people. And I think that they should be open to um, kind of older and, and more educated voices offering uh, criticism and, and ways to moderate the message to be most effective. But I think a lot of, a lot of like mainstream people who are bringing this up about them like not being educated or anything they're not interested in in um improving the movement um they just want to dismiss it you think you toward an israeli perspective like well, Israel if you look at, for instance, what I mean, what the, there was that segment on CNN um, just th that everybody was sort of upset about today and some of this coverage on Morning Joe and elsewhere um, has been overwhelmingly, you know, um, not representative of, you know, what the students are arguing. You see people just repeating police propaganda, debunked information live on air. So, yeah, I don't think that cable news, I mean, I'm writing a piece on this right now. That's why so many young people are, are getting their news from places like Twitch and elsewhere that are actually providing on the ground reporting rather than these pundits on cable news that are just spouting sort of political talking points. Doctor, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with Taylor. Looking at these movements on campus, they are absolutely organic. What I think is interesting is that if we look at the far right, which is where I spend a lot of my time, first, we've seen crazy things over there. Uh, to their point, though, like, yes, it is organic, but so were the BLM movements. And, and that was like a, that was a global thing. There were people protesting across the world. But that doesn't also mean that um, there are not actors, bad faith actors that can hijack this and um, either make the movement impotent or radicalize people 
um, in a certain direction to where they really become um, ineffective in their advocacy and their activism. And basically we see, just like we saw with the BLM, like um, protest, um, nothing really happened. There was a lot of energy. There was a lot of passion around it, but we didn't really get a lot of progress. And I worry that the same, something similar will happen here. I feel like a lot of people think that we are like in a sprint to a ceasefire or um, even a sprint to like Palestinian statehood and independence. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it's probably going to take at least a generation, if not more, for the Palestinian people to um, achieve like good living conditions and a good government. And I think that's going to take constant uh, support and activism that entire time. Not just a snapshot in history, not just a couple of months, not just a couple of years, but a long-term thing. And, and, and I, I, like, I don't see the majority of people protesting right now having the chops for that. And it's not, again, not to take away what they're doing right now. Not everybody is going to be a lifelong advocate or activist around one issue, and that's okay. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's good to not be naive and, and to be aware of misinformation and radicalization that can happen. Yeah, right, to go to, like... Neo-Nazi sites, the Daily Stormer having pro-Palestine flags at the top because they're anti-Jewish, right? Um, and then what we see in the the not quite as extreme kind of very pro-Trump MAGA movement is that they hate everybody and they're just really happy to be able to have this moment where it's like, hey, we control the libs and that's actually maybe politically useful for us now. Um, you know, I think they're seizing on a very natural development and division within the, the more progressive side of the country. It will be very interesting to me to see if foreign state actors or organized Republican actors start trying to explore that more as we go into the summer. Well, then Taylor. Yeah, I would not be surprised in the least if I, I think that I think that Donald Trump's support of Israel. And if you're if you don't if you're not aware, um, Donald Trump would be infinitely worse for the Israel-Palestine situation than than Biden has been. Um, as as disappointing as Biden has been on the issue, he is showing uh, willingness to shift. Um, the State Department has been shifting. The rhetoric in the State Department has been shifting, and that is a positive sign. Um, but Trump, like his big message, basically is you have to kill them all. And uh, if I was president, this wouldn't be happening. Um, Israel loves him so much that they uh, named a illegal settlement after him in the Golan Heights. Um, him moving the uh, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and uh, moving the embassy there was a huge middle finger to Palestinians because um, any sort of peaceful solution is going to be a two-state solution. And um, that would mean that part of Jerusalem would go to the Palestinians. Um, but basically, Trump saying that, giving it to Israel, saying it's theirs, um, just totally cuts them out of, of any sort of um, peaceful solution that they would be happy with. Uh, if you look at look up like the map that he he proposed, it greatly resembles uh, the Bantustans of um, apartheid South Africa. It, it would just leave them totally disconnected and weak. And so, I, I don't think that Trump would shift uh, to become like pro Palestinian. But if he could find a way to. Um, be more pro-Palestinian or, or better on it than Biden. I think I I'm almost like 99% sure that there is a large number of leftists that would vote for him over, over Biden, despite everything else about Trump and, and his stated political goals for, um, 
his next term if he wins. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of uh, allyship between illiberal leftists and illiberal fascists on the right when it comes to this issue. Uh, there are some that are like very, um, and, and not even like pro-Palestinian, but more anti-Israel because of the anti-Semitism that is on the right. But also there's a lot of um, support for Israel for various reasons. Some support Israel and are still anti-Semitic. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't believe that Trump would move. I think he would probably lose more Republican votes than he would gain leftist votes. But I do think that he would gain leftist votes if he um, became better on Palestine than Biden. Um, and there are plenty of leftists right now that are just like totally fine with him winning um, because of how Biden has handled things. And I, I think that that is irrational and, and dangerous, but it is what it is. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile the way uh, marginalized groups, many of the people in these marginalized groups, obviously they are fighting for um, Palestine, right, for the Palestinians and for what's happening in Gaza. But yet in Gaza, they would not have any freedom. You know, <laughs> they don't have freedoms. That's. I, what, what, what kind of argument is that? Like, <clears throat> so we're just would be like, okay, just fuck them then, like let them die. I, what? Like, what well, you can't <sighs> look, human rights in Gaza, women's rights, marginalized people's rights are not great. They're not. Uh, minority groups, marginalized people would not fare well in Palestine, in Gaza, at least. And that, that's just a fact. That's just a fact of, of Hamas and the kind of government that they are. And um, that's bad. But that doesn't mean that all the people there are like that. That doesn't mean they deserve to die. That doesn't mean that they don't deserve independence, that, that they don't deserve to be a free state. They deserve to be alive. And they deserve the freedom and the space uh, for those things to be able to be addressed. There's not going to be progress on human rights in Gaza while they are under occupation, while they are being bombed. That's just not going to happen. There's not going to be progress on uh, women's equality, on uh, LGBTQ people to just be able to exist without persecution. Um, the... the Gaza is very uh, gender segregated and that is enforced. Um, there is no freedom of press. Um, there's not really like uh, a justice system. Um, if, if, if they suspect you of being a collaborator, they will just shoot you in the street. Um, I need to go look through again. Uh, may have been like a Human Rights Watch or something. Went through like the the issues that they have there. I believe like LGBTQ people are jailed, um, sometimes beaten, sometimes killed. I don't know if that. I don't think that's like a matter of policy. So like, we can acknowledge that. I, I don't think that that should be brushed aside that that's the reality in Gaza. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about those people there because there are LGBTQ people there. There are women there. There are children there. Just because uh, the government there is an oppressive government and does oppress their people um, doesn't mean that we should not uh protest their deaths you know 
It's in Texas and Florida. Does that mean? But they don't. But I understand that. But Taylor, Taylor, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. If I go to Texas, they're not going to throw me off of a roof. They're not going. So we shouldn't advocate for the oppressed people. No, no, I'm not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm just asking. But like, what's what's what 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 kind of answer does he expect? Like, what what? Where's the like intellectual curiosity there? Like what? I don't understand um, the point that's trying to be made. Asking you, there is a disconnect because there are women and minorities are treated. Disconnect. Okay, go we, on. We should we should advocate for the rights of people all over the world to live happy and healthy lives, whether or not they have an oppressive government or not. You know, I I don't I, I can't even remember if gay marriage is legal in Israel. Is it? Yeah. It is. Oh, okay. Uh, it's it technically yes and no. Um, the gay marriages are not performed in Israel anywhere. Um, and then civil, civil unions are not, um, uh, recognized. If you want to get married, you have to get married somewhere else in a different country. Um, if you do that though, and come back, they will recognize your marriage. And so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, slightly more progressive, but, um, well, I mean, you know, a good bit more progressive, but it's, it's not like, uh, they're not bastions of LGBTQ, uh, progressivism. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, I, I think that it's, I it, believe it is. I think it is. I, I actually don't think a... it. Yeah. I actually am not so sure okay. about that either way, regardless, right. There are places we are, we, we are seeing rights stripped right here in America, right? Um, especially when it comes to the trans community. So it's just a ridiculous argument to say, oh, well, these people are oppressed by a political government, you know, by their own political government. So because they're oppressed by their own political government, whoever's in power, uh, we shouldn't advocate for their human rights. Well, that what? is the argument whenever someone comes on, when I, when I hear, and especially from that's older people, silly, it's like, that's a why, very silly why are they, argument. why are they on the, on the side that's, why are they on the Palestinian side? Because they would not even be able to have these protests there. Women can it's it's just a it's a uh, reactionary talking point to try to dismiss like there's no real um, argument or point being made there. It's not, they would have to walk around with their faces covered. Gay people would not even be allowed. That's what you hear from. First of all, you don't have people. to walk around with your faces covered in Palestine. As many female journalists in Palestine, actually, many female journalists in Palestine have been openly speaking about this. They have been covering their own slaughter, you know, live from the ground in Palestine. Um, but again, even if it was a repressive regime, which it is in, in many ways, a repressive system, government system, even if those people over there are oppressed, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help them. We, we fight for oppressed groups all the time. There are oppressed you know, countries in Africa as well where people are being starved to death. Does that mean that we shouldn't send aid there? That is so ridiculous. And also we should look at our own country and see the way that our own citizens are being repressed and say that, you know, hopefully that doesn't mean that we should just stop helping all the women in Texas because they have a governor or, you know, person in power that doesn't believe in women's health care. That is a very... It's also like a very Christian conservative thing um, where... Um, and, and like a tribalistic thing where they believe that um, like the differences between them make these people less human um, where like we, we, we see this same kind of attitude with like uh, immigrants or um, just other minorities where it's like, well, they, they don't hold our values so they don't deserve the same kind of uh, respect that we deserve. And um, it, it just comes from a very skewed and grotesque kind of worldview, honestly. Very ridiculous way to think about sort of human rights. So I still, I have not gotten to the, the age gap here because there is a definite age gap because the younger people are saying what you're saying. The older people are saying what I've told you that folks are saying. I'm not saying this. I'm giving you the argument of what people are saying when they come on this program and what I'm hearing from, especially from older Jewish people, Dr. Jen, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And, uh, this and is even not... their kids disagree with them. Not all <laughs> yeah, of them, but I, some of them. I, I think that's right. Um, I, I think that's a, a fair observation. Again, not everyone for sure. I know a lot. So I think, I think it's, it's hard because there, there are a lot of the young people are, um, not very well educated and a lot of the older people who may have more knowledge on the issue uh don't have the right perspective on the issue um or have a very skewed understanding of the issue um and so there there are some older people who 
and, and you don't have to be older, but there are some, there are many people who have a uh, very good understanding of the issue that, that care about the issue too, that can and are offering insight into the younger people to like how, uh, how they can best organize, how they um, can best present their message, how they can um, kind of purify their movement. Um, even Norm Picklestein, uh, not long ago, uh, gave a talk at, at one of the college protests and basically said like, you know, the, the things that you chant your message in general, it, it needs to be crystal clear and, and, and there's no room for like misinterpretation. There's no room for, um, you know, being sidelined. And his thing was like, you know, maybe instead of saying from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, you say Palestinians will be free or just say ceasefire now. And um, because so many times and, and it seems like th these people don't care about optics at all when every successful protest movement in the past has been incredibly, incredibly focused on optics. If someone says brings up like. Okay, like they're, you know, when you talk about intifada, that's that's kind of a big word that's being used in these protests a lot. And like you just can't divorce it from its history. They'll say, oh, well, like the, the dictionary definition of intifada is just, you know, to shake off or, you know, rise up or, you know, whatever it is. It's like, okay, uh, but we're, we're not talking about the dictionary definition definition here uh there are two intifadas that happen and th there's a history behind them and so when you use that language it evokes that history a and you just can't like you, you you like to to just say well that's ridiculous to to uh compare the two or, or to think that like the dictionary definition is this. So it's like, you, you know, that's not what we're saying. It's like, okay, well, one, like you, you just can't divorce it from the history. And two, instead of putting out this clear message, now you're constantly sidelined trying to uh, give the definition of intifada and, 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 and defend your use of it rather than talking about the actual issues rather than, uh, talking about what you, what, what needs to happen right now, ceasefire right now. There's no ambiguity in that. There's no, um, okay, well, like, uh, what, what do you actually mean by that? And this is the same thing with from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It, it's so disingenuous to say, to, to act like, um, flabbergasted when somebody brings up that that might be mean that Israel and Israelis uh, get genocided themselves and, and that they get totally wiped out from the land because to a lot of people, that is what they mean. That is what they want. And historically terrorist groups have adopted that term to mean just that. And so it, it's disingenuous to, to act like that, 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 uh, Raise has no historical um, um, background, or to to act like you don't care about the uh, the imagery or or the ideas that it evokes. And again, instead of talking about the actual issues, instead of being very clear in your messaging, you're constantly getting you're constantly getting sidelined, trying to clarify what you mean you're giving so many opportunities for people to misjudge what you're saying and it's not good and you can say well we should just be able to say whatever we want and i don't care what people think and uh obviously don't matter that's just not true martin luther king jr his movement um fred hampton all, all the successful movements in, in the civil rights movement were incredibly focused and concerned on optics and con constantly uh, moderating and, and figuring out what was going to work best, what was going to be the most clear. Um, Nelson Mandela, 
his tactics were very clear. He was very focused on optics and, and how, and, and understood that, you know, once they got what they wanted, they were still going to have to live with the white people that were there. And a big reason why uh, uh, that movement was successful is because they ended up winning over the hearts of a lot of people in that area. And so it, it's just something that you have to um, be be mindful of and think about. A lot of people are the me who are Jewish that are supporting the Palestinian cause here, but also, um, you know, having a difficult time. But I think part of that comes from this this image that we've had in the media for a very long time that I think is largely fair, that Israel has been a very strong ally of the U.S. in the Middle East. And if you sort of came up, you know, especially if we're looking at the people a little older than us, right, came up through the Cold War um, and are looking at, like, what are these traditional American allies like? Israel is one of those, to suddenly see them like flipped onto the other side from what's been the predominant narrative, I think is a little bit jarring, where if you come from a younger perspective, and you've really been steeped in anti-colonialism, um, advocating for the rights of marginalized groups, you see this dynamic much differently. And of course, these are like broad strokes, right? But I think that's right. one of the primary things you see playing out here. I, look, people are offended by that whole colonialism, that colonialism word. They're also offended by the genocide word, Taylor. Um, again, if you talk to younger people, they'll say, it, it's a genocide. It, what's happening in Gaza, they are, uh, the Israel are, are colonialists. Uh, are colonizers, I should say. And the older people say, what are you, are you kidding me? They're not colonizers. This is not a genocide. They're fighting for their existence. I think I, I, I don't really care about people being offended at those terms, but I, I do think that they matter. And I think that people have this idea that like, um, that like bad things are on a spectrum and genocide is like at the end of that spectrum. And if, if it's not, genocide if you say that's not genocide then then you're moving down the spectrum of of bad things and lessening it and uh i just don't think that's true um to me i think it's very important to be clear about reality and what's happening i think it is possible that um there could be genocidal intent but we just don't have like the evidence for that. And, 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 um, the evidence of the intent to commit genocide. Um, and the thing is, is that if, if, if that intent is there, if Israel is the evil Nazi equivalent, uh, group, that a lot of people are making them out to be. The thing is, is that there, there's really no reason for Palestine to ever stop fighting. Um, and that kind of seems to be Hamas's intent. Um, the top leaders of Hamas are worth billions of dollars and live a life of luxury in Cutter. And they seem happy to indefinitely throw their people against the rocks of a military that they have no chance against ever. And what needs to happen is leadership in Gaza that is willing to come to the table in good faith and work out some sort of agreement for Palestinian independence and statehood. Some agreement around peace. But there's no reason for them to do that if Israel are Nazis. You know what I mean? And so, to me, I think it's it's best to focus on the issues that, that are happening. Again, you're getting sidelined arguing about the word genocide when that's not important. The word is not important. What's happening is important. Um, you can also get sidelined on the word apartheid. And I think a good case can be made for there being apartheid in the West Bank. But also apartheid is a very specific thing. And, and, and the uh, term was coined for apartheid South Africa. And I think it's used a little too loosely sometimes. And so rather than talking about the differences in treatment of Palestinians from area C versus area B versus area A, 
um, it's just all apartheid and we, we're not really talking about the conditions. And then we get sidelined arguing about the word apartheid. Um, that can kind of all come off a little nitpicky, I guess. My thing is, is that I feel like we project a lot of our own Western understandings and um, values and stuff onto this uh, conflict and onto these people that are very different than what we understand in the West. And um, I, I think it it would be better for us uh, rather than being dogmatic on terms and everything to, to be dogmatic on um, what's actually happening and dogmatic on um, helping these people have the space that they need to survive, but also to figure out what work, what's going to work best for them for the future. I think there's way too many people that are really dogmatic on one versus two state when, and I, that's just silly to me for people in the West when um, there's not a clear consensus on that with among Palestinians, whether they want a one or two state. Um, there's not consensus among that, on that among, among um, Israelis. And so it, it just feels weird as colonizers in the West to be like uh, dogmatically telling these people in the Middle East how they need to draw up their borders and, and run their governments and stuff. So I, like, I just feel like we could we could take our hands off a little bit of, of that and back off of that kind of rhetoric a little bit and just be more focused on clear things that, that we can you know push for that are realistic that can happen right now to save lives, to give Palestinians breathing room for peace to start to come in, for de-radicalization to start to come in, and for these people to figure out what they want to do um, amongst themselves. Um, I don't think that mass murdering, you know, 13,000 children, over 30,000 innocent civilians is fighting for freedom. I mean, I think that there is a level of indiscriminate violence that has been condemned by many human rights groups. I mean, I think when you have, when you talk about the, the, the age gap in this discourse too, I think you need to think about people. I mean, I'm a, I'm a millennial, so I'm a little bit older than these Gen Z folks, but we all came of age during the war on terror. Um, if you haven't seen too, um, the state department just released a, um, document stating that it, it's reasonable to assume, uh, that Israel has violated international law. Um, in their use of U.S. weaponry. Um, they say the evidence is incomplete, um, and, and it's hard to, like, suss out specific strikes or bombings as being, like, a violation just because of, like, fog of war stuff and, and it being hard to really, like, verify certain things. But basically they're saying, based off of the casualties and the death rate, um... It's kind of being clear that they're not following international laws when it comes to, like, assessing uh, civilian casualties, um, uh, assessing their targets and whatnot. So that's something to consider. Um, but basically what they're talking about here is I remember when I was young, um, this may be different for other people who didn't grow up Christian I'm in my early thirties now, but I, I grew up Christian and very like, uh, Zionist evangelicalism. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I was given like straight up propaganda about Israel being the Holy land and, and, uh, Jews being God's chosen people. And basically like, you know, God will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. So like, no matter what, you've got to support Israel. And, uh, as, as an atheist now, like, obviously that's, that's totally gone. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I have a different perspective and, um, a lot of older people are going to have different perspectives, um, than, than the younger people. But also I think a, a lot of younger people are projecting their own kind of Western understanding of things onto the situation and coming to wrong conclusions. But again, that doesn't mean that they're wrong as far as protesting and wanting the violence to stop.
here. We saw what happened in September 11th. I mean, I know people that went over to fight in Afghanistan and came back realizing that it was basically a worthless war. You know, it wasn't it wasn't even about, you know, safety. So much of it was just about this sort of like retribution for this attack. And I, you know, I think that there's just this anti-war mindset and, and scrutiny on sort of U.S. Um, military operations around the world. I also think you have to consider the, the media that these people are consuming, um, which is what I cover a lot. Um, if you are to watch cable news, you would have a wildly different view of what's happening. You're getting a lot of police statements. You're getting a lot of government sources. You're not hearing from the students themselves. You're not hearing from people on the ground, and you're not hearing from a lot of Gazan journalists. And so I think a lot of young people are turning to those primary sources, and so they have a very different view of what's happening. They're watching people on Instagram, you know, run for their lives from, from bombings. And so I think that affects their perception too. And without having a pundit sort of, um, you know, ha having it filtered through a pundit or filtered mm -hmm. through a correspondent. But it's interesting that you say that because I worked in um, in broadcast and cable news for years and the demographic, I mean, it's in the 60s for people who watch yeah. it. So you can see why they may, they may think that. Um, it, it, you said if they're watching cable news, here's the thing, only 16% of adults under 30 favor the U.S. providing military aid to Israel to help in its war against Hamas compared to 56% of those 65 and older. So there is the explanation um, somewhat. Doctor, you're a college professor. You specialize in internet culture and, I'm just, and by extension, younger Americans. I'm just wondering, on these campuses, where is the line between actual legitimate protests and rioting? I think everyone will agree that the destruction of property is like a bit too far, but but people should be allowed to protest. It is in the First Amendment, freedom of expression. Where's the line? I think this is, I think this is the line that, that a lot of universities are trying to walk with varying levels of success right now. I'll say at the University of Maryland, um, I think we've done pretty well overall. Um, but yeah, you know, you want students to be able to come out and and protest and demonstrate. Um, you want everybody to feel safe on campus. And, and I would say from my observations, you know, across the campuses that I've looked at, that's generally what's happening. But there are a handful of people, and these stories get really amplified, who slide into anti-Semitism. And, and we can have a whole talk about how there's like a lot of things set up to make that pretty easy. That is not predominantly what's happening within these protests. As Taylor pointed out, there's a lot of Jewish students joining in on these protests. But it's easy to see it amplified when that goes wrong. And of course, that has become a big part of the cable news discourse is what are these anti-Semitic tropes that that can be fed to, to these students who, who maybe don't understand the history behind that, that they can repeat and not really understand what they're doing. And then that becomes the focus of big donors of the colleges, of congressional uh, testimony of college presidents. So no, of course, nobody wants any, anything destroyed on campus. We don't want riots. That's generally not what we're seeing. But I think, I think there is this appetite for stories about how things are going bad because of what the kids are doing. And so when there are these incidents, it's easy to focus on them and you know, a few actors who have clearly crossed the line. Okay, I've gone to several protests. I live near NYU, and I do hear, you know, intifada, you know, chants of intifada. And I do hear chants of from the river to, to the sea, and those are deemed to be anti-Semitic, Taylor. Yeah, I think certain people, you know, consider certain things anti-Semitic. I think I know that there's a lot of controversy over from, you know, from the river to the sea specifically. I think there's a lot of controversy around. Also, I mean, I covered the Black Lives Matter protests. You hear how people talk about the phrase Black Lives Matter, right? Whenever there are these protests that have these slogans, I think they're political. I think I think a good um, a, a good parallel. Uh, to the BLM protests would be a cab. Um, it, it was just a horribly ineffective uh, phrase. Um, it, you know, very divisive, very inflammatory, and you're constantly having to like clarify what you mean. It's like, okay, well, you know, we're not saying that like every cop is. A horrible evil racist but like they're all a part of this you know bastardized system and so and it's just like okay, like okay what what's the point of the phrase if we're, if we're having to you know it's like it's like having to um explain the punchline of your joke every time it's like it's not it's not effective and, and when they say like uh you know defund the police that's just not as catchy and sexy as saying Okay, we need to evaluate the funding that these police departments get and, and redirect some of that funding towards like um, mental health professionals that can respond to people in crisis versus, you know, police officers when appropriate. And it's like, you know, it's like we, we just weren't able to get that point across effectively. And so while, you know, a lot of people, me included, I don't have like a problem with the term ACAB. A cap. I don't have a term, a problem with the term defund the police, but it's like you have to you have to consider the optics of of the chance and the words that you're using. Because otherwise, it's just a lot of energy. It's just like a lot of you getting your frustration out. It's a lot of being flashy and in people's faces, uh, but you're not actually really doing anything to further your cause. Um, and so and I, I think that that is. Um, has the possibility of some of the same things happening here with people chanting intifada, with people chanting from the river to the sea. Um, 
and, and, and stuff like that politicized and from the river to the sea is a specific thing. I will say, though, that that's not what I've heard from the majority of students. A lot of, the majority of students that I've spoken to on these protests have a quite nuanced view. Of course, when you're marching through the streets of New York City, there's going to be hundreds of people and you can always find these outliers. But if you talk to the media liaisons or you talk to the actual organizers of these protests, they have extremely nuanced, thoughtful views. Most of many of them, at least, are Jewish themselves. Um, and I think they very much reject their Jewish identity being co-opted um, by politicians, for instance, saying that, you know, criticism. And that's why you see a lot of these students um, like deferring to talk to anyone um, and people say like, well, this is really weird, but it's like, you don't want like just whoever randomly shows up to your protest to be a public spokesperson to the media on what you're protesting. And so generally it's a good idea to ask people to not speak to the media and have a media trained liaison be able to convey, you know, who is organizing the event or organizing the protest to convey what the message is. Um, so that way... Because, you know, the, the whole point is to uh, gain awareness for your message. And if if the people putting out that message are very unclear or are come across coming across very anti-Semitic, it, it's just going to absolutely neuter your protest. Criticizing the state of Israel in, in these ways is somehow. So do you think the, the cameras are drawn to the, you know, the hyperbolic part of the of the protest? Literally just last night, literally just last night, I'm in the encampment on UCLA. There's no, almost very few mainstream media. It was me, another colleague of mine, and someone from the AP. Outside, there's a single guy with a giant Israeli flag and a bullhorn shouting. All of the cameras are trained on him. It's just, I think that there, it's, it can be a little bit ridiculous when you look at this coverage, because I think the media can optimize for conflict. Let's be real about who's, you know, instigating a lot of this property damage. It's the police. The police are breaking down the windows, smashing doors, you know, instigate, like escalating these conflicts. There are, Taylor, I do have to tell you, there are, I mean, there's video of, of the protesters breaking windows and smashing. Yeah, so that, that, that has happened some. Um, there has been, so some of them are breaking the rules. Um, these colleges you know, they, they are allowed to protest there, like, um, you know, within reason, um, within like reasonable accommodations. Um, some of them like broke the rules by staying overnight. Some of them broke the rules by like occupying a building, um, by defacing property, by destroying property. And uh, for that, like, I mean, if, if you're going to, I, I'm all for civil disobedience, but when you're going to engage in civil dis disobedience, uh, second part of that is getting arrested. And that's when you need to say, all right, yep, I, I broke the rules. Let's go away quietly. Take me to jail. Uh, that's what you saw in the um, civil rights movement when people would do sit-ins. Um, when it was time to get arrested, they would be peaceful, not give the cops any reason to uh, pop off on them. And the cops still did brutalize them oftentimes. And because they were peaceful, because they, um, you know, were breaking clearly unjust laws, um, the focus became their message, their movement, and how unjust they were being treated by the police. And um, some of these people like fighting with the police and, and, and stuff is just like, it's just, it, it just is taking focus off of the message, off of the movement, and then putting it on. Now it's okay. Now we're talking about police brutality. Now we're talking about um, the right to protest. Now we're talking about, you know, the response from these colleges. And it, it's just like all kind of getting jumbled together when the message could be much more clear on Palestine. Um, yeah. So civil disobedience, I'm all for it. Second half of that is you have to accept when it's time to uh, get arrested and go peacefully. Ashing doors at, at Columbia. I'm sure when the police, right, when the police were called, when the police were called, previous to calling the police, and I think that when you look at the response to different college campuses and you look at the way that different colleges have handled this, I think plenty of colleges, I don't know about the University of Maryland, but it sounds like are doing a good job. They're giving students a space to voice their opinions peacefully. These are peaceful, very largely peaceful demonstrations. Then you have colleges come in with these SWAT teams to essentially assault, you know, students. Um, Why do you think they're doing it? Do you think they're afraid of what happened to Claudine Gay? Do you think they're afraid of donors? Do you think they're afraid of parents? Do you think that they're afraid of because uh, what they believe to be the truth is the, the students don't and they don't want to hear it? Is it, you know, are they, are they, uh, squ are they squashing the freedom of speech for the 
that well, certainly they're squashing freedom of speech, and especially in my opinion, like what we saw with Columbia and arresting student journalists, that's never a good sign. I don't know. You know, I, I think it's very hard to be a college administrator. I don't envy their position. I think calling the cops on your own students has a really dangerous history in this country, and a lot more of them should think critically before doing it. Because we see that the police time and time again, we know this from things like the Black Lives Matter movement, Alfred, police constantly escalate situations. And that is not a that that is generally not a productive way to resolve these sorts of things. So I think there are but there are campuses that have handled it well, and we should look to those campuses. So, Doctor, then what's what's an administrator to do? What's a college president to do? What are the you know police or authorities to do in these situations when they are? It is a private a private institutions, and they're trying to yeah. keep order. Yeah, you know, so so this is a difficult line to walk for sure. Um, I think you know you have there's very clear rules about behavior, and of course it gets squishy when you actually try to interpret those. Um, one example that we had very early on at the University of Maryland, um, you know, shortly after, um, you know, probably mid October, um, was at a pro Palestine uh, demonstration. There was chalking of Holocaust 2.0 on campus. I think the students who did this intended it to imply that Israel was committing a genocide, but you could certainly ha see how it was interpreted by some in the Jewish community on campus as a call for another Holocaust against Jewish people. Um, how you handle that as an administrator is a difficult question. What, what we ended up doing on campus, or rather the administrators on campus did, was put together a lot of people on campus to come have discussions together, talk about the way to do this productively. And, you know, I think a lot of people are still upset, but it's worked. I think you do get people crossing the lines on both sides, whether it's smashing property, whether it's harassing students, which I've also seen videos of. And to be clear, like the, the instigators of like any kind of violence have definitely been like pro-Israeli uh, Zionist. Um, some of the responses they had were absolutely unhinged. And, and I think that the Police response is, uh, I don't know, overly militaristic, I, I would say. Um, and, and then you need to enforce those rules. But as Taylor says, when you call the police in and the police don't know how to deal with that, it makes the situation a lot more complicated. If you have police who do know how to deal with these situations, like I think we saw at George Washington, where um, the Capitol Police in D.C. are very used to handling demonstrators and, and overall handled that situation well, didn't escalate it like we saw at Columbia, then you don't get the situation escalated where the administrators then have to make more difficult conduct decisions, uh, decisions about charges, because everything is kept down at a lower level. I'm just wondering, listen, I'm trying to understand, you know, all of it here. I hate to, I'm not going to both sides this, but uh, if there are students who are trying to get to, to class, um, if, if and I'm not saying it's happening, their lives or if safety is in danger, then what do you have to do? I mean, it's, it is the, it's the administration's job and it's also the police, um, law enforcement's job to, to keep the majority of the people. So like, yeah, some of this stuff, like, I, I don't understand why they were doing this, like, um, like linking arms and like surrounding people or like, just, or like literally like pushing them away with their bodies like you can't you can't do that um those people have just as much as a right to be on that campus as the protesters do and if they are causing a problem you you get the police get administrators involved um otherwise like you can't you can't push pe people with your body you can't like crowd them and not let them leave or not let them move about freely in the area. Um, that, that was not a good look at all. Well, safe on campus. And well, how can you do that if people don't listen to you? If they're not, if they're, if they are actually breaking into buildings, how, but, what do you do? Yeah, but I, I, you know, here's another thing, just since you brought up safety, right, is we've seen this sort of, I hate to even call them counter protesters, almost trolls, especially at Columbia. I was at Harvard recently. There was an instigator out like this. Even, you know, what we saw two days ago at UCLA, we saw violence inflicted by these pro-Israel groups that came to specifically, um, you know, do violent attacks on these pro on this, this peaceful encampment. They were throwing fireworks. You know, there's been assaults. And I don't think that the universities have done a good job of managing those factions either. I think that they have... I mean, especially UCLA the other day, right? Like they sort of just stood by. They didn't protect the students. The police didn't step in. The police didn't step in until the next night when they attacked the students themselves. I think there's ways that we need to sort of just take the temperature down here and de-escalate. And I think the police are generally not productive in most of these situations. As outside of maybe the Capitol Police, like you said, if there's police that have experience dealing with peaceful protests. But these protesters, especially I mean, when I was at Harvard um, earlier this week, they're not preventing anyone from going to class. These are students themselves. Like they're in this pe these peaceful encampments, you know. There are people sort of preventing people from going to class. I've seen videos of it. Okay. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, oh, oh, sorry. One other thing too. Let's not forget that a lot of those hateful slurs that were found, especially at Columbia, were shouted in some instances by these pro-Israel trolls to okay. try to smear. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why we can't just like say, yeah, if that's happening, that shouldn't happen and move along. Like we don't, I, we, why is it hard to bite that bullet? Um, because that has happened and it's not, it's not good. It's not okay. Um, yeah. And even if they are counter protesters, as long as they are not causing problems, they're allowed to be there too. And I will agree that the, the police response to the, um, counter protesters attacking the encampment was, uh, unacceptable. But yeah, just bite the bullet and say, yeah, if that's happening, that should not be happening. Um, yeah. 
near the protest. So and Doctor, I'm going to let you get in, but just one more thing for Taylor, because you have been in it. Maybe you have seen it as well, Doctor. Uh, but the use of force, you think that the, the use of force is way disproportionate to what is needed, Taylor? Undeniably. We shouldn't be shooting rubber bullets point blank at students, at peaceful protesters. The, these students, by the way, when you actually speak to them and they are happy to speak to the media, like they have very clear, very reasonable demands. And instead of focusing on that, I think they're bringing in the silence and escalating the situation. And I think that just police generally are not very well trained to handle these types of situations. Go ahead, Doctor. Uh, you know, to the point that Taylor was making, I mean, and Don, you had made, I have also seen these occasional videos of students being prevented going to class. I don't think that's representative of what's going on on campuses, but it is a thing that's happening. And in those cases, the university policies are very clear about the kind of discipline that comes from that. And I think if that's enforced, not against everyone who's, say, camped out on a campus, but on the people who are actually doing that, it allows you to take those bad actors who maybe are having difficulty not crossing the line out of the equation, make them subject to normal campus discipline and not include the entire protest movement, whether it's for this or any issue in that. Because Yeah, so that's, that's just not, that's not hard to... To concede. There's some people acting that way. Hmm. Okay. Can we move on? As everyone said, what they, this is going to continue, sadly. And it's, I'm telling you, it's diff, It's a difficult conversation to have because I have to be honest with you. I understand both sides of it. Again, I hate to both sides. Of it. I understand that, uh, especially students on college campuses, they should be given a wide berth to uh, learn, to protest, to grow, to figure out and to be able to express their opinions and what they want to say and what they believe in. But also they should be safe, right? People should not be blocking them from class. I don't believe that people should be breaking windows and, 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 you know, um, and, and going into, into buildings. Right. And I just, I just, you know, I think it, I think it ruins the message uh, and it, it offers your enemy or the, you know, the person uh, that you're fighting against. It gives them an opportunity um, to say that you're doing something wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? And not to really focus on the issue that you're trying I to. Just, I just want to be clear that the majority of like the, the damage that's being done is often because of the like, this. Yeah, I don't disagree situation. with that. I don't disagree with that because when it first started happening when, and when I what I witnessed at NYU, there was no violence until the police came in to break it up. Right. But I don't think that that's what happened at Columbia the other night. I think that people, you know, they were upset because they were trying to get rid of the encampments and then they broke into a building uh, and they broke some windows and not just the windows not just one set of windows, but windows within the building, uh, and they were, you know, uh, boarding themselves. Yeah, and then uh, that one campus where people, like, barricaded them in a, or barricaded themselves in a building, and then, like, the other ones who were doing, like, a hunger strike and, and saying that they needed, they needed, like, humanitarian aid, they needed food to be brought in. Um, it's just, like, it, it you, you're taking... Again, taking focus off of the message, off of the issue, and putting it on yourself. What was me? I'm 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 doing this hunger strike, and uh, you, you know we, and she, uh, like it's just, uh, and it looked silly. This woman, like, just like, uh, yeah. There, there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of energy. The strategy is not always there in some of these cases in the building with police barricades and with desks and what have you. I just don't think that's good for your message. I, I think that that does more harm to what you're trying to get out than good. Let's talk about other things though. Okay, so uh, the far right and AI, internet AI, and boy, do I know about this, especially when it comes to one social media platform um, that is, I think it's mostly filled with trolls. I'm not sure if it's real people and I don't know what's going on. So as I mentioned, doctor, you are an expert and you're also the watchdog for far right uh, group through, you have the Substack on MAGA report, as I said in the beginning. What is the connection between the two where, where AI and the far right sort of converge here? And how do we know if these people are even real on these social media sites? <laughs> Yeah, well, that question of whether or not they're real, especially on some certain <laughs> social media sites these days, is, is absolutely a real and important question. Um, a lot of them aren't. And so there's so many ways that AI play into this. You know, up until 18 months ago, the main way that we saw AI uh, interacting with the far right was actually kind of as an unintentional recruiting tool. Because all these platforms, when they feed you content, do it to optimize your engagement. Extreme content is more engaging. Whether you agree with it or not, if, you know, if you want to argue with it and say that guy's mad, platform's happy because it keeps you on the platform. And we saw studies, The algorithm example, pushes that. They, they, absolutely. They, yeah. Yeah, Facebook um, did an internal study that uh, somebody got a hold of in the media that found that something like 68% of people who joined far right groups on Facebook joined them because Facebook's algorithm recommended those groups to them. And Facebook's response to that was to basically shut down the internal group that was studying it. So, so we know, especially in the last elections, like a lot of people were pushed into these far right groups that way. But now, what I would say in the last 18 months for me has been the most concerning is that we have ChatGPT and these large language models that can generate text that sounds very good. And it's so easy now to set up a troll farm uh, with a bunch of bots on platforms generating very real sounding text with arguments that people are going to believe because the tool is able to do that. And I think all of us who work in this space of like politics and AI and online ecosystems are really worried about how that dynamic is going to play out in the lead up to the election in November. Taylor, you, of course, uh, cover internet culture. What, what effect do you think AI is having on these um, extremist communities? I think everything Jen said is 150% <laughs> correct. Um, it's exactly what I'm seeing as well. Um, I think we already have a massive crisis in terms of media literacy in the United States. Yes, um, and I you, agree with you 100% on that. That's something that I can agree with you every, everything. <laughs> for the Washington Post. It's Oops. a false belief repeated by these senators. know that too, and they have found false amplification by protests, for example. 
thoughts in this family month was the thing that was supposed to one that's like completely sort of crazy um far right i mean look, look at twitter twitter has become a cesspool for far right conspiracy theories social media platform oh and there's a lot of us who have phds and long this, I sort of clinical level and a lot of division and how <laughs> it's exactly worried about how that dynamic is going to play out in the lead up to the election in November. Taylor, you, of course, uh, cover Internet culture. What, what effect do you think AI is having on these um, extremist communities? I think everything Jen said is 150 <laughs> percent correct. Um, it's exactly what I'm seeing as well. Um, I think we already have a massive crisis in terms of media literacy in the United States. Yes, um, and when I you, agree with when you 100 you... percent on that. That's something that I can agree with you. Everything. everything. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> we found one thing. Yeah. It's, it's really bad. And I, but I think that's leading, as I mentioned before, to a lot of division and how people get their information. Um, I think that, yeah, we're not prepared for these deep fake, you know, calls. And often by the time that it's regulated properly or by the time these scams are called out, the elections happen, right? So it, it's, I think we need to take a lot of steps now to take this, this technology seriously and, so, and um, properly. So I just don't know why she can, she can understand the threat towards, for, for this kind of stuff on the right. Um, but then say that like the, what's happening on the left is 100% organic or that there's no, you know what I'm saying? Like there, there's, that threat is there for the left as well. That does happen. And so like, we just got to be mindful of that. Um, as much as we do for the far right. I mean, even before AI, like, you know, bots, right? Mm -hmm. How do you know what's real? I mean, doctor, you study this, right? On a, on a, a sort of clinical level and on a minute level. How do you even know, especially with the, with the, with bots? And then now you have AI, which you, you might, you may really think you're talking to someone, right? Because it's artificial intelligence. How do you even know? I think like the majority of the time, if you, it, it's pretty easy to spot, honestly, like if you are media literate or savvy, like in the least, the majority of the time, like, um, you can just go to the profile and see like how they post and it's going to look like a bot. Um, or if you're seeing like a post in, um, like in a vacuum, typically it's, it's going to kind of. A lot of times it'll take like the form of a news uh, tweet, but there, there'll be no sources, um, but it'll, it'll all sound very official. And all you have to do is do a quick Google search and you can see if it's real or not. And if there is no source linked, typically it's, it's not going to be real or it's going to be highly, highly editorialized to where the real story is nothing like what is being posted on, on the social media. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to know. And there's a lot of us who have PhDs and longer years who have tried to do bot detection. It's like a whole area of research because it's really challenging. And the way that like, it actually it really is what, because like what it, percent are bots? Yeah. What percent of bots? Is, let's just say, I mean, because if, depending on the social media platform you go on, right. One, there's, there's some that's like, okay, sort of middle of the road. Right. And then there's some that's one that's like completely sort of crazy, um, far right. I mean, look, look at Twitter. Twitter has become a cesspool for far right conspiracy theories. And I'm not sure if the people who are responding or liking or hating or whatever, if they're even real people, if it's just not bot farms, you know? Yeah, I mean, my, my intuition, and I will say, like, I haven't done scientific studies of, like, the current state of Twitter, um, but I run some very big accounts over there. And it's so interesting that, like, paying the eight bucks a month was the thing that was supposed to get rid of the bots. And I am just inundated with, like, obvious bots with blue checks on Twitter now. Like, the problem is orders of magnitude worse than it ever was. Um, and, I, you know, I think just, you know, as someone who kind of gives a clinical eye to what's going on and spends a lot of time on Twitter, um, the bot problem has gotten huge there. And, and I think that's true of the far right bots as well, not just the foreign bots and the spam bots and all of those, um, that part of the power that social media has had, and, you know, I think this goes to Taylor's point when we were talking about Gaza and the protests, social media has been transformative for allowing voices that are traditionally marginalized in the media to be seen and consumed. Twitter was so powerful if we look at the Ferguson protest, for example, that never would have gotten that kind of coverage and launched that movement if it were traditional media covering it. So there's great things for amplifying those voices. But uh, the oppressive forces know that too, and they have found false amplification by creating bots that make it look like there's a big movement behind something is powerful. And a lot of people see, wow, there's all this response, there's all these people talking about it. And now the AI is there to make it so easy to generate all these different seeming voices that'll have coherent conversations. I I think a lot of what we're seeing there is bots and especially on the far right um, where they frankly have been very good at embracing this kind of technology to push their movement. Can we talk about TikTok please and this ban, proposed ban of TikTok? A lot of people are going to lose their minds if TikTok goes away, including my sister who's actually older than me. She's in her 60s and everyone says, oh, TikTok, it's young people. No. Um, so what, you think it's a good idea of what the, the Biden administration is proposing about a TikTok ban? 
Taylor, I'll, I, I think it is it's deranged. It doesn't, I mean, no, it's not a good idea in any sense of the word. It doesn't, like, none of what these lawmakers claim to be concerned about, like, none of those issues are addressed through, through banning TikTok. You so know, the loneliness right. issues, there, there are people no, who are saying... No, that that it, it, it helps people. It, it helps connect people well, on all it, the platforms, too. But also, it is believed, Taylor, that, that that is why young people on these college campuses are so pro-Gaza, uh, is because of false the algorithm indeed. on TikTok. Exactly. And that is a false and very debunked, my colleague Drew Harwell wrote an excellent debunking of that for the Washington Post. It's a false belief repeated by these senators that, frankly, can barely turn their own computers on. I, I don't even know where they're getting this. And, and, you know, all of these concerns around data privacy, I think we ha should have very legitimate concerns around data privacy, but Congress has repeatedly taken zero steps